Uh, my name is Jason Schillestrom. I'm one of the uh, assistant professors of psychiatry at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio, uh, here in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, uh, today we are going to uh, talk about depression, uh, depression in the elders. And so from this talk, what I want you to learn is the uh, criteria for depression, how depression is diagnosed. Um, I want you to learn some screening questions for depression and uh, specifically um, uh, screening questions related to risk of self-harm is, is what we'll particularly focus on. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the causes of depression, uh, outcomes of depression, why it's important to treat depression, and then we'll also touch on treatments and therapies, uh, treatments both um, uh, pharmacological treatments for depression, as well as um, uh, therapeutic treatments uh, for depression. And so to begin with, uh, we'll discuss the uh, criteria for depression. And so, let's see here. And so to be diagnosed with depression, there's, there's specific symptoms that are involved in, um, in the uh, uh, clinical diagnosis of depression. The first one is pretty straightforward is that a person has to have um, depressed mood. And in elders, this one can be challenging. And so sometimes with elders, um, they may not say they feel depressed, particularly elders with severe cognitive impairments. Uh, so if someone has late stage Alzheimer's disease, if we ask them, do you feel depressed? They may say, no, they, they don't feel depressed. Um, and so in children, uh, the criteria get, can be modified a little bit to where the focus isn't so much on depression, it's on irritability. And so in elders with late stage dementia, we too will sometimes um, ask our, uh, the, the patient's care providers, you know, do they seem depressed? And the answer might be yes, it might be no. Our follow-up question is, well, do they seem irritable? Are they easily frustrated? And so, so depressed mood um, would be the first one. Um, sleep changes. And so people with depression can have, uh, can, they can either sleep too much or they can sleep too little. And the, the classic sleep pattern uh, that we'll see in depressed and people with depression are what are called um, early morning awakenings. And so people with depression, uh, they'll wake up at four in the morning and they just can't get back to sleep. And so early morning awakenings is kind of a classic um, sleep change. However, it could be that they're just sleeping all day. It could be uh, that they just never sleep at all. And so sleep changes. Uh, loss of interest. And so loss of interest is, is, is what it says. People um, no longer participate in activities that they used to enjoy. Uh, guilt is pretty self-explanatory. Um, decreased energy. Uh, decreased concentration, uh, appetite changes. And so appetite changes, again, might be loss of appetite. They just lose interest in eating. And a lot of times that's what we see in older people. In younger people, we might see the opposite, where they eat more than they ever normally would. Okay, so appetite changes can go either way, as can sleep. The next one would be um, decreased, what's called decreased uh, psychomotor activity. And so again, this would just kind of be the, uh, that apathetic stance that, uh, that you'll see where they just kind of slump in the chair and, and they're not moving around as much. And then the last would be um, suicidal thoughts. And these are thoughts that life just isn't worth living anymore. And so the clinical criteria for depression are a person has to have a depressed mood and they have to have five of these other symptoms for a period of two weeks or more. That's the, that's the definition of major depressive disorder. Um, a depressed mood, 
in addition to five of these other symptoms for a period of two weeks or more. And they have to feel um, this way for the majority of days, for the majority of time during that two-week period. So there might be a moment, you know, there might be, you know, that they might have had a good day. It's possible that they could have a good day. Maybe there was an anniversary or a birthday or who knows. They can have a good day, but in general, they feel depressed for, um, for, for a two-week period. And if a person has a, a depressed mood and then these other symptoms for a period of two weeks or more, uh, then that would qualify as a major depressive episode and then they would be diagnosed with what's called major depressive disorder. There are other diagnoses of depression. So for example, there's what's called dysthymic disorder. There's just kind of depression not otherwise specified where they don't meet exactly this criteria. So there's other types, but really to be diagnosed with major depressive disorder, what we commonly think of as clinical depression, um, this would be the, uh, the criteria. And so, so um, I, I think what's important to know is that depression is an illness and as an illness it does have specific criteria. So we wouldn't diagnose someone with depression or major depressive disorder based on you know, a symptom here or a symptom there. It really is a clinical diagnosis with um, well-defined criteria. So, so that is depression. Um, next, I want to talk a little bit about screening. Actually, I'll leave this up. But I want to talk about screening questions for, um, for depression. And so in elders, probably the most, common, uh, the most commonly um, utilized screening instrument is what's called uh, uh, the geriatric depression scale. And there's different versions of this scale. Um, the, the version that's used most commonly uh, in nursing home settings and in, in geriatric psychiatry outpatient settings is it's a 15 item scale. And so this asks questions like, um, you know, do you feel happy most of the time? What I like about the scale is that it's always yes, no answers. And, um, and sometimes I have to beat a yes, no answer out of my patient. <laughs> and so for some of my patients, it's, uh, I might say, you know, do you feel happy most of the time? And the answer is, um, well, you know, there's days where my grandchildren visit me and life is good and I had a good meal that day and I slept well the night before, but then there's other days where I, you know, feel sad and depressed because I haven't heard from my daughter and whatever, whatever, whatever. And so, um, so, uh, for, so for these screening questions, what I have to do is I always have to say, okay, the answer won't be yes all the time. It won't be no all the time. Just in general, most days, yes or no. Do you feel happy most of the time? Yes or no. And, and, then, and, and so we'll go through these screening, screening questions. Um, are you often in good spirits might be another question. Uh, do you feel your situation is hopeless? Um, uh, do you think that most people are better off than you are? Uh, do you have enough energy during the day? Um, these types of questions. So there's lots of different screens. Um, the one that's used most commonly is called the geriatric depression scale. It's a widely distributed instrument. And of these 15 <laughs> screening questions, if a person gives a, a positive response, um, a positive depressive response to five or more of these screening questions, then we start to really think about a clinical diagnosis, the potential for a clinical diagnosis of, um, of depression. The, the, um, the other questions though, for screening questions that I want to talk about are um, for, for risk of suicide. And so it's, you know, how do we gauge suicidality in, in older people or in, in people, in younger people even. And so, suicidality. And so this is, um, and so there's different ways to do it. The first thing you have to know in, um, you know, in continuing care retirement communities is that if, if you don't ask about it, then you're not going to know about it. And so um, it, it, it's very rare that a person will volunteer these thoughts. And so in clinical settings, we, we have to ask. And so, um, and so 
uh, you know, different docs have different styles, and so I can tell you what, what I do. And so the, the, the first question I'll ask is, um, uh, is it wonderful to be alive now? And so that's usually my first question. You know, is it wonderful to be alive now? And if patients say yes, then uh, I, you know, I know that I usually have uh, nothing to worry about. The person says it's wonderful to be alive, and, uh, and there's no thoughts of suicide. However, um, sometimes I'll get an answer like, um, well, um, I wouldn't say it's wonderful. Um, would, would, would you think it was wonderful if you were in my situation? Um, it's, it might be okay to be alive now. I, I guess it's better than the alternative. <laughs> and so, um, and so I kind of, they'll hesitate. And so when they hesitate, um, my follow-up question is usually, um, is it wonderful to be alive now? Um, is life still worth living? And, and then we'll see the answer to this question. The answer might be, well, yeah, it's not wonderful, but yeah, life is, is still worth living. I have my family, and, um, and I know they care about me, and so um, you know, I wouldn't want anything to happen because it might, you know, it might affect them. It might hurt them. And so it's not wonderful to be alive now, but, but yeah, life is still worth living. On the other hand, they may say, um, you know, life really isn't worth living anymore. Um, I've lost all my friends. I'm not happy. I have all these medical problems. Um, in fact, life's not worth living anymore. And then the follow-up question to that is, uh, do you have thoughts of wanting to die? And so if life isn't worth living anymore, then the follow-up question is, do you have thoughts of wanting to die? And, and their response might be, um, well, no, I, you know, I, I don't really want to die. Um, you know, maybe I have these reasons to live. Or the answer might be, yeah, you know, I do have thoughts of wanting to die. I, I really am ready to die. Um, um, it's, not worth, it's not wonderful to be alive. Life's not worth living. And, and I think I am ready to die. And then the follow-up question would be, um, do you have thoughts of wanting to take your life? And so patients now might say that, you know, they do have thoughts of wanting to die. You know, they're ready to die. Um, but what they want is, is to just die in their sleep. They don't necessarily want to take their life. They just want to... to um, they just want to die passively. And so this is, when people say, you know, do you have thoughts of wanting to die? And the answer is yes. But do you have thoughts of wanting to take your life? And the answer is no. Then kind of in the, in the psychiatry jargon, this will be referred to as passive suicidal ideation. So they have thoughts of wanting to die, but they don't necessarily want to kill themselves then that would be um, passive suicidal ideation. But then if the answer is, do you have thoughts of wanting to take your life, and they say yes, then the next question is, do you have a plan? And so, uh, and so then we'll find out, do they actually have a plan to take their life? You know, do they, um, you know, have they thought about what they might do? And they might say, you know, I do have a plan. What I plan to do is I plan to, um, overdose on my medications or, uh, you know, I have a gun at home or um, whatever the plan might be. And then others might say, well, I do have thoughts of wanting to take my life, but, I, you know, I don't have a plan. Um, um, they might say something like, well, suicide is a sin, so I would, I would never do that, or, um, or suicide would, um, it, it would just hurt my family too much. And so I would never do that. Um, and so they might just stop with, you know, do you have thoughts of wanting to take your life? Um, yes, but I would, I would never do that. Or they might say yes, in which case we need to find out if do, we, do they have a plan or not. And so this is the safety discussions that we have with our patients. What I've found is, you know, going through these questions in this order, um, 
you know, what I like about them is that, you, is that I start off with, um, you know, questions that are easy to ask. You know, it's very easy to ask, is it wonderful to be alive now? That's, that's easy for me to say. Um, what I've seen with my um, students and residents who we drill, um, you know, suicide risk assessments into their brains, what doesn't work well for them, and the truth is it doesn't work well for me, is to have the first question be, are you suicidal? I've, I've found that that goes almost um, nowhere unless the person is um, about to kill themselves like right then. Um, uh, what I found is that if you can ask the questions in, in an order like this, is it wonderful to be alive now? To, is life still worth living? Do you have thoughts of wanting to die? Do you have thoughts of wanting to take your life? Do you have a plan? If you can kind of stair step down um, in that way, it's much easier to approach the conversation. The person, and, and then the other, the re, I think the reason it's easier to approach is because it, it gets the person talking, right? And so as long as they're talking, then you can just get more information out of them. And so these are screening questions for um, we've talked about screening questions for depression, and these are the screening questions that I'll use for, um, for suicide risk assessments. And so we can turn now to, um, to depression, so again, or to causes of depression. And so in general, for causes of depression, um, these can be divided up into psychosocial or medical. So depression is divided up into psychosocial causes or medical causes. Um, the causes of depression vary so widely, especially with psychosocial. Um, probably the, 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 the worst question to ask when talking to a depressed person, uh, the worst question to ask might be, um, why are you depressed? And so uh, I've found that this goes nowhere. And in general, with my students and my residents, I strongly discourage them from ever asking why questions at all, regardless of what the question is. Um, you know, why are you depressed? Um, why is your blood pressure high? Why don't you take your medications? Why, 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 why? I find that why questions um, usually go nowhere. And for my medical students, I always use the example of, you know, the question that every medical school applicant um, is fearful of is, you know, why do you want to be a doctor? Why do you want to be a doctor? And so they'll lose sleep over this question. And, and how nice it might be if instead of being asked, why do you want to be a doctor, if someone had said, um, um, you know, uh, uh, can you explain your reasons for wanting to become a physician? Can you help me understand your reasons for wanting to be a physician? What a nicer way to ask that question. When people ask why questions, um, automatically the person who's being asked the question becomes defensive. Automatically. And so then what happens is, is they just make something up. And, and it might be based on truth or it, or it might not. But, but either way, um, if you ask a why question, you're going to get a defensive answer. And it might be a real answer or it might not. Oftentimes, it's based on truth, but it's not really the answer. And so, again, the worst question to ask is, why are you depressed? Because um, they'll either say, well, I don't know, or, um, or they'll just try and say something just to move forward. So don't ask, why are you depressed? Um, it would be much better to say, um, can, you, can you help me understand some of the reasons that led to this depression? What, what do you think might have caused this depression? Um, it's, it's, if you can ask a, a, in a non-threatening way, you'll get a better answer every time. So we can talk about psychosocial causes, and there's tons of psychosocial causes. I can tell you most commonly um, in my geriatric clinic, the, the reasons that I'll hear, probably most commonly is that someone close to them died. Um, that's probably the most common answer that I hear, the most common psychosocial reason. It's, you know, well, my, my spouse died, my child died, um, someone else close to me died. And so when, when, when someone close to you dies, 
there's, there's, there's two losses. And so the first loss is, of course, the loss of the person who passed away. The other loss is uh, when, when someone close to you passes away, when someone close to you dies, um, you become much more conscious of your own mortality. And so when people become more conscious of their own mortality, then uh, not only are they having to deal with the loss of the person who, who died, but then they're also, um, they'll develop a death anxiety as they become aware of their own mortality. And so we'll see this in older people. We're, we'll see where someone close to them died and not only are they grieving for the loss of their loved one or their friend, um, they're also much more aware of their own mortality and they're struggling with that as well. And so, so psychosocial reasons, um, that's probably the most common. Other common um, causes are just strife with family. Um, that's another real big one. Um, and then also loss of independence. And so, um, you know, I have several patients who um, had never been depressed before in their whole lives uh, until they were told they can no longer drive. And since they've been told that they can no longer drive, um, uh, they just feel like life just isn't worth living anymore. They can't drive, so how can they go visit their friends? How can they visit their family? How can they meet their needs? Um, they feel um, more dependent on younger family members or on other care providers. And so psychosocially, um, those are probably the, the three most common reasons. Um, uh, death of a loved one, um, family discord, and then loss of um, functional abilities. And, and similar with loss of functional abilities, it could be, um, for example, not being able to drive anymore, but it might also be loss of basic functional abilities. And what we'll see, and this kind of ties in next to medical, will be um, things like you know, not being able to walk anymore, for example, or incontinence is another really big one that we'll see. When people become incontinent, they're no longer able to hold their urine or their bowels. Um, then they become just anxious and they're afraid to socialize, they're embarrassed, and so we'll see that. So loss of functional um, abilities is another big one. For medical, there's a lot of medical reasons for um, depression. And so when someone comes to my office, um, one of the, um, you know, we're always trying to decide, you know, might there be a medical reason for the depression? And so common medical well, and then just to backtrack, it's not, in, in, in older people, I do have patients who will come to my clinic who may have a lifelong history of depression. That, that certainly happens. But what seems to happen um, at least as often, if not more often, is that a person will come to my clinic at the age of 75 or 80. And they've never been depressed before, ever. They've never seen a psychiatrist before. They've never been in a psychiatry hospital. They've never, they've never tried to harm themselves. They've never taken any psychiatry medications. And now, from out of nowhere, at the age of 80, they're depressed. And so, particularly with those cases, what we want to look at is medical causes. Might there be something medically that's contributing to their mood state? And so there's lots of different medical, um, uh, medical um, causes of depression. And so one would be stroke. And so people can get, um, of course, classic stroke where you have paralysis, you know, hemiparalysis on, on, on one side of the body. There's these big strokes. And, and of course, the big strokes where you lose sensory and motor functioning, of course, those can lead to depression. But what can also happen is that people can just get um, very well-placed, small, 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 you wouldn't even know you had it, strokes in the frontal part of the brain or in the deeper structures of the brain where you don't lose motor functioning, you don't lose sensory functioning, but these, um, the lesions are uh, nonetheless trigger these mood impairments. And so, and so cerebrovascular disease 
is a common cause of new onset depression in older people. And, and, and in the medical literature, there's this whole name for it. It's called vascular depression. So you might hear this person has vascular depression, and what that implies is that strokes are contributing to the depression. But there's other medical things as well. And so, for example, um, we'll always check thyroid status. And so having low thyroid hormone is classically associated with depression-type symptoms. Um, when people's thyroid hormones drop, um, they become very um, uh, motor retarded. They become very slow. They're not able to do anything. Their sleep gets all disrupted. And, um, and the, 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 their whole metabolism just slows down. And then that can lead to depressive states. Um, there's also uh, metabolic changes. And so metabolic changes can lead to depression. Um, probably the one, the one metabolic change that we'll see um, that, that leads to these true major depressive disorders is disruption of calcium metabolism. And so we'll check um, uh, electrolytes and make sure that sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, we'll make sure that all their electrolytes are in good order and that there's not um, uh, any, uh, uh, any metabolic impairments that could be contributing to the depression. Um, we'll also look for um, anemia. So you can imagine that if a person is anemic, anemia, if a person is anemic, if they don't have enough um, uh, cells in their body carrying oxygen um, to, uh, to vital parts of the brain, we know anemia leads to loss of energy, loss of motivation, which in turn can lead to these depressive episodes. And so when we think of the causes of depression, we are... Um, we are always considering not just psychosocial causes, which are very important, but particularly in elders, we're looking at might there be medical causes for the um, depression as well. You know, it, it would be very poor form to be treating, um, you know, hypothyroid-induced depression with Prozac. Okay, Prozac or fluoxetine is a great medication, but um, we would never. Um, want to be treating uh, a hypothyroid state with just a, uh, an SSRI. So, so when patients come into our clinic for depression, we're talking about psychosocial, potential psychosocial reasons, and then we're also talking about potential medical reasons. And, and so the next thing I want to talk about is, you know, why it's important to treat depression in elders, particularly elders. It's, 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 it's important in, regardless of age, but in elders it is particularly important. And the reason is, is because um, in elders, depression is a high, is a strong risk factor for mortality. What we know in elders is that depression kills older people. We know that. Depression kills older people. This isn't so much true in younger people. D depression isn't associated with increased mortality rates you know, beyond that for increasing suicide. But in elders, even not counting suicide, depression kills older people. Um, and in some studies, what is shown is that if a person has depression, that depression has the same five-year mortality rate as congestive heart failure. And so you can think about what the mortality rate for congestive heart failure might be. It's high. And in some studies, depression will have the same five-year mortality rate as congestive heart failure. Depression is an independent risk factor for mortality. And so you can ask yourself, well, why might this be? And so you might say that, well, depression, you know, people who are depressed are more likely to not exercise. And that's true. But even after you control for apathy, depression still kills older people. So then you might say, well, people who are depressed are more likely to smoke. And that's true. However, even when you control for smoking, exercise, name whatever psychosocial variable you want, depression is still an independent risk factor for mortality, for, for death in older persons. And the reason seems to be because in older persons, depression changes uh, physiology. So there's these physiological changes 
that are associated with depression, particularly in older people. And so some of these physiological changes, one of them is heart rate variability. And so, um, so with heart rate variability, heart rate variability is a strong um, predictor of, uh, of cardiac health. And so you don't want uh, an arrhythmia. You don't want to have an arrhythmic heart, like ventricular tachycardia or atrial fibrillation or something like that. You don't want an, ar uh, uh, an arrhythmia. But nonetheless, um, in healthy people from beat to beat, there's variability in the timing from beat to beat. And the more variability there is in timing from beat to beat, the healthier your heart is. And so heart rate variability is a, is a strong marker for cardiac health. And in people with depression, people with depression develop decreased, what's called decreased heart rate variability. The, the beats from one beat to another become less variable. They're more exact. It's always the same amount of time from beat to beat. And decreased heart rate variability is a very strong predictor of um, cardiac mortality. Okay? So people with depression have decreased heart rate variability. Um, if you look at how the heart is innervated, it's innervated by a nerve called the vagus nerve. And if you trace the vagus nerve up, 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 as high as it goes, eventually it, it, it'll land into centers of the brain that are associated with, um, with mood, as it turns out. And so it seems that perhaps, perhaps this decreased heart rate variability is mediated by um, these brain changes that are affecting the nerve that's innervating the heart, the vagus nerve, perhaps. But nonetheless, we know people with depression have decreased heart rate, decreased heart rate variability. The other factor is you'll get inflammatory changes. And so when people are sick, um, their white cells um, secrete, and other cells in the body secrete what are called inflammatory um, proteins. And so these are things like interleukins and other cytokines that are involved with uh, cell cell signaling and, and the treatment of infection. And so in people with depression, People with depression will get these inflammatory changes where either these markers, these, um, these proteins that are used to fight infection will either become way too high or they'll be way too low. And so depression is associated with, in, with um, these inflammatory changes which seem to affect or decrease the body's ability to fight off infection. And so people will just become more vulnerable to illnesses like pneumonia um, and other infectious diseases um, that, of course, are associated with increased mortality in elders. And so people, so we'll get decreased heart rate variability. We'll get these inflammatory changes, which are associated with decreased immune responses. And then the third is you get hormone changes. And the hormone, or one of the hormones that changes quite a bit is called cortisol. And so cortisol is uh, secreted by your adrenal glands. And cortisol is the hormone that's associated with kind of the fight or flight responses. It's a stress hormone. What happens in people with depression is that cortisol levels get, and, and elders with depression particularly, is that cortisol levels get pushed upward. And so people get these hypercortisolemia states where there's too much cortisol. And cortisol can be neurotoxic. It can kill brain cells, and it also affects all the other organs in your body. And so the learning point here, what, you know, what I want you to know is that it's important to recognize depression, um, not just because of necessarily, not necessarily just because of quality of life, but also for survival. Depression kills older people, and the reason it kills older people is because it changes their physiology. Depressed elders have a different physiology than non-depressed elders, and that change in physiology um, uh, increases many risk factors for mortality, such as heart rate variability, your ability to fight off infection, and your ability to cope with stress. Okay, so that is um, one of the consequences of depression in the elderly. So now we can talk a little bit about uh, treatments. And so for treatment, what's Nice about depression, there's nothing nice about it, but if there was one thing that's nice about it is that it's, it's, um, 
uh, and particularly in elders, it's, it's without a doubt one of the um, easiest diagnoses to treat. And so uh, in younger people, it can be very challenging. But in older people, for whatever reason, they seem to respond. Elders seem to respond very well to many of our treatments. And so for every illness, you're going to have um, psychological tr uh, treatments. And you're going to have um, uh, uh, pharmacological treatments. And so we can talk a little bit. I don't want to talk a lot about psychological treatments, but... Um, but I'll talk a little bit about uh, 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 common ones. And so with psychological treatments, this would be um, typically we're talking about therapy or, or, or counseling type, um, type treatments. And, and a lot of times with these treatments, with the therapy, we're trying to influence behavior, behavior and thoughts. And so one of the ideas... Um, with psychological treatments, people will, people will get um, what's called cognitive behavioral therapy. It's a very common therapy. And so, so in general, the, uh, a cognitive behavioral model of the mind would be that we have feelings, we have um, thoughts, we have behaviors, and we have what are called just kind of physical reactions or physical symptoms. And all of these are connected. So this is a cognitive behavioral model of the mind. Feelings, thoughts, behaviors, and physical symptoms. And so we can start with, this is getting messy, but okay, so we'll move it over. All right, so we can start with feelings. So commonly in our depressed um, patients, the feeling will be depression. Right? Depression or anxiety will be the feeling. And that's the feeling we're trying to, to treat. For physical symptoms, you can imagine that, particularly in elders with um, depression, the physical symptoms are commonly related to pain and chronic pain. And so, so there might be cr um, pain. If, if we were talking about anxiety here instead of depression, physical symptoms of anxiety might be increased heart rate, trouble um, breathing, sweaty palms, that kind of thing. So you have physical symptoms. For behaviors, again, going back to depression, um, people who are depressed, the way they behave usually is social isolation. They don't reach out to family and friends. They stay at home. They don't, they don't do new things. They've given up activities that they enjoy. So you can think of what their behaviors might be. And then they have thoughts as well. And, you know, common thoughts of people with depression might be you know, that, you know, um, you know, my situation is hopeless. Life isn't worth living anymore. Um, I would be better off dead. And so a person might come to my office and they might say, um, I'm depressed. And because I'm depressed, um, I don't think that life is worth living anymore. And so what I would say is that you're not thinking that life isn't worth living anymore because you're depressed. You're depressed because you keep thinking that life isn't worth living anymore. And so if you will start thinking different thoughts, then you will have a different feeling. Similarly, a patient might come to my office and they might say, I'm depressed, and because I'm depressed... Um, I don't do anything. I sit on the couch all day and I'm just not doing anything. And I'll say, you're not doing anything because you're depressed. You're depressed because you're not doing anything. And so if you'll start doing healthy behaviors, then you'll start feeling a different feeling. You'll start having healthy feelings. And so, so this is a cognitive behavioral model of the mind. And so this is where things like exercise. It's always, everything in medicine always comes down to diet and exercise. And so depression is the same way. It's, you have to get off of the couch if you want to feel well. And so we'll ask them, you know, what are things you used to do for enjoyment? They might say, well, I used to exercise. And so I'll say, okay, here's what you're going to do. 
for 10 minutes, three days a week, you are going to walk on a flat surface for 10 minutes. And I don't care if you just walk to your mailbox and back for 10 minutes, but you are going to walk for 10 minutes three times a week. And so again, we, get, we start getting them doing healthy behaviors. Similarly, we start having them develop healthy thoughts. And again, as, um, as their thoughts change and as their behaviors change, their feelings change. And so that's an example of um, psychological treatments um, or non-pharmacological interventions. For ph pharmacological um, interventions, there is a lot of medications out there that are very good for depression. Um, in elders, probably the ones we use, in elders we're sensitive to drug-drug interactions. We don't want our medications interacting with their calcium channel blockers, their uh, beta blockers, their pain medications. And so probably the ones we use most commonly um, are um, sertraline, probably sertraline, um, uh, what else, citalopram, um, mirtazapine, um, venlafaxine, uh, duloxetine. Those are probably the ones that we use most commonly. There are other ones out there that we use. So we might use bupropion. Um, we generally, in elders, we generally don't use fluoxetine, which is Prozac. We generally don't use paroxetine, which is Paxil. And the reason we don't use those two is because they, they have lots of drug-drug interactions with medications that older people commonly take, such as beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, pain medications. So we generally don't use paroxetine or fluoxetine. But apart from that, almost all medications can be used. These are examples of ones that, that we would use um, um, probably more commonly than others. And so what these medications do um, they have different effects, and so um, in general what they're doing is, is they're either um, they're increasing the levels of a chemical in the brain called serotonin, or they're increasing both serotonin and norepinephrine. And so both serotonin and norepinephrine are associated with depression, and, and what's been demonstrated is that if you can increase these levels in the brain, then the depression will resolve. And so depression, however, we treat it like any illness. There's pharmacological interventions and there's non-pharmacological interventions. I always tell my patients that there is no magic in these bottles and that um, if they really want to start feeling well, they can't sit around on the couch and wait for the pill to kick in. Um, they do need to do the non-pharmacological interventions. They do need to exercise, eat well, put themselves on a schedule. Um, I'll have them do other activities like, you know, they, if they've given up calling family members and they used to do that, I'll say, okay, every Wednesday night you need to call your daughter and you need to talk to her for 10 minutes and that's what you need to do. That is your plan. So there's always non-pharmacological therapies and we base it on their um, their, uh, their previous lifestyle. So for example, if this person has never liked talking with their daughter, then I won't recommend that as a therapy. But if it's something that they used to enjoy, that they just no longer do, grandchildren, whomever, then we have them engage in these non-pharmacological treatments as well. And so medicine and these behavioral interventions do go hand in hand. And together, they work quite well. Um, you know, I don't want to say that the treatment response rate is 100%, but it's, it's close, especially in elders. It is, it's, it's close to that. Um, and so, uh, so that is treatments for depression. Well, thank you for your uh, kind attention. Right, so the question is, is how do we differentiate between dementia and depression? And that's a really good question. There's this whole idea out there of um, pseudo-dementia is mm -hmm. the name of it. It's called pseudo-dementia. So pseudo-dementia is when a person seems to have a dementia like Alzheimer's disease, but in reality they don't have dementia. It's just that they're so depressed that they have cognitive losses result um, secondary to the depression. You know, I can tell you the way in these really tough cases, the way that I do it is I just ask the question, do you feel depressed? 
And so in, in people without major cognitive loss, so these are people, for example, if you use the mini mental state exam, and people who have scores of about 15 or higher, um, if I ask people, do you feel depressed? And they say, no. And then I ask lots of leading questions r related to depression. Um, then they don't have depression. So for example, I'll say, do you feel depressed? No. Do you have thoughts that life isn't worth living anymore? No. Do you have guilt? No. Do you feel helpless, hopeless, worthless? No. Then if, if they have those you know, negative responses to those types of questions, but they have cognitive impairments, then I start to think about dementia instead. And so the, re the real challenge in our clinic is discriminating between depression and apathy. And so the, a behavioral manifestation of dementia is apathy. And so people might actually bring their loved ones to my clinic saying, um, you know, I'm bringing my dad in because he just seems depressed. He's not doing anything. He sits on the couch all day. He's given up his interests and activities. And I think he's depressed. And just look at him. Wouldn't you be depressed if you were in his shoes? And so we say, um, well, sir, um, you know, do you feel depressed? We'll go through those questions. And it might be um, often what happens is, is that he's not depressed. In fact, he's apathetic. And apathy is a symptom of the dementia, not the depression. So, so, that, so, so to be depressed, to have clinical depression, it is suicidal thoughts. It's guilt. It's hopelessness. It's helplessness. It's worthlessness. It's kind of those cognitive symptoms. You know, they sit around and they think that their lives aren't worth living anymore. Sometimes it's just really hard to tell. And, and if I'm ever conflicted, then I, you know, what I do is I um, really talk to families about treating depression. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is because depression is just so treatable. The medications that we have now are so safe that there's almost nothing to lose by go ahead and treating for depression and seeing if we can get a response. Um, sometimes there is, sometimes the risks of that approach would outweigh the benefits. But, but if there aren't risks to that, then that, that, that is one of the ways that we'll, we'll manage that. That's a good question. I was particularly interested in the nursing home population. Um, you know, we have residents that are, are verbally alert and able to explain everything to you, and we have the other side of that of residents that are not. Do you use the family to get the information that you need about the depression of that adult that has lost their verbal skills? We, we do. We, we, and we count on family, and we count on the nurses and the aides, maybe even more than the family, in fact. It, it, for some patients, um, the, the, the nurses and the aides tell us everything. And again, they're able to describe um, the depressive symptoms in the setting um, that they're in. They, they, they see them all the time. And they're able to say that, you know, this person just doesn't participate in activities. They, they just stay in their room all day. Um, they have crying spells. So the person might not be verbal, but they still might have these crying spells. And, and the nurses and the carries can give us. Families, of course, I don't mean to underestimate the importance of family um, collateral information. Families can tell us, you know, how this person always was, and, and, can, and we can use that information to compare them to baseline. So, so, yeah, collateral information is everything, particularly in nursing home settings, where, as you're just saying, the person might be a verbal. Um, or they might just be so cognitively impaired that they're not able to attend to the questions that we're even asking them. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have a question? Um, please. My question is, um, as far as medication, the medicines are concerned, yeah. um, do they become ineffective at any time? Or Yeah, you know, kind of the classic, that's a good question. When do the medicines become effective? The classic answer is that you don't know the full effect of any medication until a person has been on that give, uh, any given dose for four to six weeks. That's the classic textbook answer. However, elders are different. And it's because you, you can imagine that the depression of an 80-year-old who's never been depressed before, 
is going to be a different, a lot of times there's a different pathophysiology to that depression than, for example, to the depression of a 30-year-old um, who's depressed for whatever reasons or a 25-year-old who's depressed, for example, maybe postpartum depression. And so there's lots of different pathways to get you to this clinical syndrome of depression. So in elders, you know, in, in most, almost all of my patients will tell me that um, they notice a difference after only about a week or so. Um, usually after being a, on the medication for a week, they start to notice a difference. And they may not be able to say what the difference is, but a week or so, they notice that there's a difference. After a couple of weeks, commonly what we'll see is that if anxiety is a component of their depression, after a couple of weeks, they're usually, usually able to say that the anxiety is better. This is a common pattern. So the depression might still be there, but the anxiety is better. And then the mood symptoms can take you know, four, up to maybe eight weeks in, in older people at any given dose. So a common strategy in my clinic is, in my clinic or, or when I do nursing home consults is we start people on low doses of the medications because elders are more vulnerable to side effects. And then um, a lot of times what I'll do, particularly in, is to push this, usually I, I start at half the starting dose and then after a couple weeks I ask them to bring it up to whatever the normal starting dose is and then we follow them up at four weeks. And usually at four weeks, um, will increase the dose again. And so in elders, the trick, in, you'll hear in elders to start low and go slow. Start low and go slow. And that is true. You do need to, with the medicines, you need to start at lower doses than you normally would. And maybe you do need to titrate them, some, in some cases, slower than you normally would. However, the key, without a doubt, I'm waiting for the person to write the textbook that says start low, go slow, but keep going. And the mistake that I consistently see um, is that uh, you can take sertraline, for example. So sertraline is dosed, uh, uh, a typical starting dose is 50 milligrams. It's increased, you increase it by 50 milligrams every four to six weeks and you can go up to 200 milligrams. Consistently what I'll see is people will start at 50, they may get up to 100, nothing's happening yet, and so then they switch to another medication. And then they switch to mirtazapine. So mirtazapine is dosed at 15, 30, and 45. So they'll start at mirtazapine of 15 milligrams. Maybe go up to 30. It's not working. And so then they switch to another medication. And, um, and that's always the wrong approach. If a person's not having side effects from the medication, if you can keep going on the medication to the maximum doses, that we almost always get effective responses in those cases. Yeah. So the... The learning point is to not give up on the dose, provided the person is tolerating the medication well. Right, and so if they're feeling good and mm -hmm. then decide that, I mean, they need to keep taking it. They mm -hmm. shouldn't stop. And once they start feeling good, they feel like they don't need to take that anymore. Is that going to change up their effect? Yes. Their <laughs> yeah, so if they stop the medicine, then the medicine will cease to work. What we, you know, people will ask me, you know, is this a medicine I need to take the rest of my life? And the answer is no. This is not necessarily a medication you need to take the rest of your life. What, what, what I want for my patient is six months of wellness. And after they have been well for six months straight, then we'll revisit the medication. And we'll say, okay, you've been doing great now for six months. Um, there's two things we can do. We can either make no changes, we don't want to rock the boat, and we can just hold for now. Or we can see if this medication is still helpful. It might be a medicine you don't need anymore. And I'll follow my patient's lead. Some of my patients, it just makes them way too anxious to stop the medication. They don't want to go back to that depressive state. Um, they'd rather take the medication than even tolerate that risk. I have other patients who they want to be on as few pills as possible, if any at all, and they can't wait to stop the medication. So I follow their leads and their family's leads and we develop that plan. But in general, before you stop a medicine, you want six good months. Not six eh, months, but six good months. Okay? Yeah. Anything else? Oh, thanks.
Uh, I had a question about the question I was trying to determine if a person is suicidal. Um, since there's such a social stigma connected with suicide, do you ever find that a person might be, that you, that you suspect that the person is answering, one, giving an answer but meaning the opposite? Like if you say, do you think life is worth living? And they say yes, but maybe they mean no. Or even when you get to the point where you might say, do you have a plan for to carry out suicide, that they might feel, well, what if I tell the truth? What if the truth is yes? What consequences might happen? I, am I going to be put in jail? Am I going to be put in my is independence? Sure. So do you, do you, is there a way, do you ever suspect that they're saying the opposite of what they mean or what the truth is and that you have another way of getting so, to? Um, that's always possible. It's always possible that someone might not be telling me, in this case, the truth or how they really feel. Mm -hmm. Or even if they are telling me how they feel, maybe they're not telling me the depths that they're feeling, for example. So that's always possible. But in general, um, I always believe my patients. I, uh, I, I generally only go wrong when I don't believe them, in fact. And, and one of the, you know, what I, where that is more likely to happen, I think, is when people start asking kind of these checklist questionnaires like, are you suicidal? That's where I see patients might not give um, as truthful of an answer is when it's, are you suicidal? So I always encourage my students to not ask, are you suicidal? And to actually kind of approach it in this gentle, stepwise approach. You know, is it wonderful to be alive now? Is life still worth living? And again, by getting them talking and then I'm building rapport with the patient, I'm listening to them, by having this, you know, more um, uh, gentle, by, by having this gentler approach, I, I, I find that works really well. And, and I don't feel like patients are um, not giving me truthful responses. It's always possible. I think it's more likely, though, when it's, you know, the second question, you know, your first question is, what are you here for? Oh, I'm here for depression. Do you want to kill yourself is the next question you ask. I find that when doctors have poor interviewing styles, um, then they get poor responses to the questions that they ask. And if doctors have better interviewing styles, they get exactly the information that they need. So I guess so, it's a question of trust, that, that, that you build up trust. That's right. That's right, building trust. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Okay.